Dr. Peter Atia is not a big fan of fasting anymore. Dr. Rhonda Patrick has mentioned, even on this channel, that she doesn't necessarily support fasting anymore. She's changed her mind on it. And it mainly has to do from the perspective of metabolism and muscle loss. I don't necessarily agree with that. I have some solid reasons and some data to support why I don't. That doesn't mean that I dislike them. Peter is a friend. Rhonda is a friend. We can have respectful professional disagreements on the matter. I still stand with fasting. If you still stand with fasting, drop a comment down below. Not only do I want to hear it, but it also helps the algorithm out. So always just drop a comment just to say, hey, or hey, I stand with fasting, whatever. Also hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. We're going to talk about what happens with fasting and muscle loss and why there's nuance with this discussion. We're going to get into that. I'm also going to show a couple very short clips from my interviews with Rhonda and Peter where they specifically talk about fasting. However, a lot of people thought that I disagreed with fasting when they disagreed with fasting. That's not the case. I still stand with it. Okay, I'm going to open with just a quick short clip from Peter where he talks about how he's changed his mind on fasting. Just a brief part. The first one that I would say I've changed my mind on is the importance of regular fasting. Um, so I used to really do a lot of regular fasting, um, probably considered excessive by, by some. Probably did a seven day, seven to 10 day water only fast once a quarter and a three day water only fast once a month. I think while there were clearly some benefits of doing that, it's very difficult to measure what's happening cellularly, but my belief at least was that the benefits of that outweighed the downside. The downside of doing that, by the way, is you're gonna lose a lot of muscle mass. As much as you might exercise during those periods of fasting, which I tried to, uh, you know, you're just not going to be able to maintain lean mass. So you, you basically, I was always sort of accumulating a little bit of a debt of lost muscle mass. And over a period of about three years, I probably lost about 10 pounds of lean mass. Um, and so, Today, I just don't feel that that trade-off is worthwhile. Okay, so he's mainly talking about it from a, a protein and you know overall muscle loss perspective. And then we look at Dr. Rhonda Patrick, very similar. Here's a very short clip from her. If you're skipping a meal, that's an entire meal, you're not gonna have protein. So are you gonna make up for that protein in your other couple of meals that you're gonna have? I was not doing that, I was not. And I was of the opinion that you know I was getting enough protein. And that's kind of another, I think, area I've changed my mind on as well. But the meal skipping part, I think, is the big thing that was a big eye opener for me because um, there there had been some studies where, you know, intermittent fasting had led to a little bit of, you know, muscle atrophy. Why don't I agree with this? Because when you are looking at fasting, there's a couple very important things. Number one, we're not fasting to necessarily reduce calories. There is some evidence to support that independent of calories, fasting has benefits. Metabolically, all these things. Maybe not necessarily concrete with fat loss in terms of like independent of calories. But as far as other metabolic effects, there's probably some benefit there. Now, after today's video, I put a link down below for the best tasting, highest quality honey that you could ever have. So good that you only need a couple teaspoons a day of it. It's called Manukora. It is a form of Manuka honey, and this honey is harvested in remote forests within New Zealand, which is where Manuka honey is supposed to come from. So they test every single harvest for the MGO content, which is really the good stuff. That's what gives us that antioxidant benefit. That's what gives us the potential antimicrobial effect. It's really what we're after. The higher the MGO, respectfully, the better. So Manukora is is super smooth and super creamy. So you don't even have to have a lot to get what you need. You don't have to load up on carbs. We're talking a couple teaspoons. However, personally, I like the stuff and I have quite a bit of it. I've introduced a lot of hunting into my life. So that link down below gets you $25 off a starter kit, which has a tub of MGO 850 Manukora honey, as well as five travel stick packs, a wooden spoon, and a guide on how to use it. And it sounds kind of funny, but actually timing it and using it comes into play. So that link is down below. It's manucora.com slash delour20, and that's $25 off that starter kit. So the important thing is that you're taking breaks from food, and then you're giving yourself enough time and enough calories to fully compensate for that almost as much as possible, putting yourself into maybe a net deficit of a tiny amount at the end of the week. But the most important thing, and it's something that I've talked about a few times, is when you resistance train, you send a signal to the body to maintain muscle. Dr. Don Lehman, who's like the pioneer of leucine research and protein research and muscle protein synthesis, he has even gone on record saying 60 to 70% of building muscle 
and maintaining muscle is the stimulus itself. And what happens is people do these extended fasts or even shorter fasts and they don't resist and strain. Okay, so you're not preserving muscle. You're not sending a signal that the muscle is relevant. So what happens is the body needs to know that this muscle is relevant for survival. So if you were to just fast and not use your muscles, why would your body keep something that's metabolically expensive? But if those muscles are used, then the body is going to preferentially maintain it because it seems like it's necessary for survival. Not that I disagree with Peter and Rhonda that fasting could cause some muscle loss. I think where the problem is, is there was a lack of adequate stimulus and a lack of protein. We have now seen in the literature that you do not need to consume protein immediately after a workout. In fact, protein synthesis stays elevated for 24 to 48 hours after a workout, indicating that you could fast, you could work out, resistance train, and you don't need to eat protein right after your workout. You could let it go a little longer and continue to fast. And then as long as you get enough protein in that 24, even 36, 48 hour window, muscle protein synthesis is going to be just fine. Now we've seen other literature that shows that you can have 100 plus grams of protein in one sitting and still assimilate it over a period of time. It doesn't just go to waste and get pooped out or turn to fat. This is something that I think is really important that we look at because does our body necessarily know what a 24 hour period is in the way of calories? Or can we compensate for calories another day? I look at fasting from much more than just to say, I don't know, caloric restriction perspective. Now this isn't a hill that Peter or Rhonda are gonna die on. Like I, I know they are very open-minded people when it comes to these kinds of things. But this video is important so that we can have a counter argument because a lot of people stopped fasting when they talked about it. They talked about how protein is really critical and that's really important for longevity. And I completely agree. But who says that you can't get enough protein even if you're fasting? Now, to give proper credit, Peter does make a very solid mention of these longer, more extended fasts. And if we talk about this, then yeah, that's going to be potentially problematic for losing muscle. We can see that, we've seen that in the scientific literature. But he also talks about, well, I, I think that doing a shorter fast, like 16 hours, is just fine. Personally, I am from the belief that you can go probably more 18, 20, 22 hours without having a significant amount of muscle loss as long as resistance training is in play. So where I made a big mistake and where I need to fall on the sword is for many years, I thought that doing cardio on a fasting day was going to be the best way to go because it would trigger more fat loss. And that's me looking at fasting from a fat loss perspective and that lens of fat loss only and not necessarily muscle preservation. There's newer research from Dr. Mike Ormsby that actually helped me really pivot how I looked at this. If you are going to do cardio on the days that you're fasting, you do probably put yourself at risk for muscle loss. And the net equation with that the fat that you do lose by doing cardio on a fasted day is probably not worth the risk of the potential muscle loss. That being said, the resistance training that you do on a fasting day is probably a net positive in terms of muscle preservation, even though you might not get as much fat loss as you would with cardio. However, newer research from Ormsby's lab tells us that there's a unique thing that happens. We know about what's called the epoch. It's what happens like the post-exercise oxygen consumption. What happens with that is, yeah, you continue to burn fat after intense exercise, but Ormsby's lab found something different. They found that resistance training itself actually triggered a signal to oxidize more fat throughout the rest of the day. So it wasn't just an afterburn effect of a workout. Resistance training actually changed signaling so the body oxidized more fat as a percentage later on. Even though cardio during a fasting day might help you burn more fat in that moment, resistance training preserves the muscle and actually increases fat oxidation throughout the rest of the day, which might even be more beneficial for fat burning because you're gonna get it extended throughout the length of your fast. So even though Dr. Peter Atia and Dr. Rhonda Patrick don't agree with fasting, they may have found something that works better for them and gives them more energy. It doesn't mean that fasting is dead and it doesn't mean that you should stop fasting. It means that we might need to look at this a little bit different and not just fast willy-nilly because they have solid points. But I don't think that we need to throw the baby out with the bathwater here. It's a highly effective tool. I still stand with it. I still do it. 
I have tweaked my approach a tiny bit, but it works great. As always, I'll see you tomorrow.